Hello, and welcome back to Industrial Organization. So in this uh, video, we're starting chapter three, which is an introduction to game theory. And game theory is really all about when we have multiple players who have different incentives and each of their actions impacts the, the payoffs, the profits, the utility of the other players, right? And, you know, we call them games. Um, I think that's as good, you know, a term as any, right? We can think of uh, sort of complicated games like, you know, chess and football and simpler games like rock, paper, scissors. And they all sort of share some similarities, right? We have different players. We have different uh, playoffs. We have different strategies. And game theory is a way to try to analyze that and see what the... Um, incentives are and the potential equilibria are in these different games. So we're going to start off with a pretty sort of basic introduction to game theory. Um, it will go a little bit faster perhaps than in like a principles of micro class. And if you, if you haven't seen game theory before, uh, you might want to go check out my introduction to game theory in, in my principles of micro playlist. Um, so, you know, we think of business as, as often a game, right? It's often called the, the greatest game in the world. There's a company called, you know, that markets something called the great game of business. Um, and in industrial organization, we're generally going with the assumption that businesses are trying to maximize profits. And often what we're thinking about is the competition between two companies, uh, two or more companies. Um, and so we can analyze the various strategies, whether we're talking about pricing or production um, or marketing and thinking about, okay, well, what would a rational player do um, and make the uh, sort of assumption that rational players will, you know, sort of choose those actions that are going to maximize their payoffs. So we're going to start off with a very sort of simple uh, simultaneous game, right? And so when we, whenever we type of game uh, that we're talking about, we want to think about, okay, who are the players? We'll usually focus on games with two players just because it's easier. Although, you know, when we start talking about things like, you know, Corneau Oligopoly, um, we can sort of solve those for, you know, any number of players. Uh, feasible strategies. So what can they do, right? So if we're talking about rock, paper, scissors, your strategies are rock, paper, or scissors. Um, if we're talking about chess, right, your feasible strategies are much, much larger. Um, and so usually in industrial organization, we're talking about things like pricing decisions, um, output decisions. Um, so we'll, you have to make that clear, right? The third piece is information, like what does everybody know in the game, right? And we'll usually focus on games where um, people have sort of complete information. That doesn't mean you know necessarily what the other person is going to do, but you know the rules of the game, you know the potential payoffs of the game, um, and so you can figure out what is the most rash, what's the best response um, to each of the strategies of the other player. Um, payoff, so like what are you going to get, you know, in the different uh, potential strategies. And then timing of play, right? So we often think of two different uh, types of games. So one is a simultaneous or static game where players move at the same time. So rock, paper, scissors is, you know, a, a simultaneous game. Um, or a dynamic game, which is really sort of what we think of as most games um, when we're thinking about things like chess or checkers or or football. Um, and I guess the the sort of one caveat there is that the simultaneous game, the, the players don't have to actually make moves at exactly the same time. What they have to do is make the move before they observe the other players' moves, right? So if I set my prices on Monday and you set your prices on Friday, uh, but I don't, but you don't actually see what price I've set until, you know, the next week, then that's basically a simultaneous game. All right, and then when we're thinking about information in a game, right? So complete information is generally what we're going to focus on, right? So that knows that that means that we know the different strategies, we know the different payoffs, um, and if we don't know that, then we say you know we have incomplete information, 
Uh, perfect information is usually sort of dynamic games, right? Where we're moving one at a time and, and whether or not we know the history of, of play. Um, and so most of the time we're focusing on games with complete information and perfect information. And then a lot of game theory focuses on whether, you know, each player knows the same uh, set of information, right? What's the common knowledge? Um, and, and for the most part, we'll assume that there is both, you know, that common knowledge is complete and perfect and it's symmetric, meaning that each player knows the same thing, right? A lot of the interesting sort of non-economic uh, game theory is when those pieces are not true, right? So when information is not symmetric, when there's, you know, different, uh, there's not a lot of common knowledge or there's imperfect information or there's incomplete information. Um, but for the most part, especially in IO, we'll focus on complete, perfect information. That's all common knowledge and that is symmetric. All right, so this is how we're usually going to write our games um, for simultaneous games. And so we just want to sort of understand what this matrix means, right? And so we're going to have two players. We're going to have player one, who we'll call the row player. And then we're going to have player two, who we'll call the column player. And so in this case, you can see that there's have two. they each have two strategies, which are the same. They don't have to be the same, right? We have L and R for player one, and we have L and R for player two. And so what we then have inside of each box is the payoffs. So if player one chooses L and player two chooses L, then the first payoff is for player one. So player one would get W, whatever that is, and player two would get X. Um, if player one chooses L and player two chooses R, then player one gets zero and player two gets zero. Similarly, if player one chooses R and player two chooses L, they both get zero. Whereas if player one chooses R and player two chooses R, player one would get Y and player two would get Z. And so this is called a coordination game because they get positive payouts, assuming that W, X, Y, and Z are all positive, uh, if they both choose the same thing, right? But since it's a simultaneous game, we can't see what the other one is choosing. And so we'll talk about different ways to, you know, think about where we end up, right? Um, all right. So one question is, okay, well, how do we solve these games? And basically what we want to do is we want to figure out, well, what's the best response for uh, player one given player two strategies and player two given player one strategies. Now let's start up here in figure 3.2. And we can kind of see there's two boxes that look, you know, better than the other two boxes, right? So here we have a payoff of one and one if they both choose L and one and one if they both choose R. And so what we're going to do, the way I was sort of taught to do, to find the Nash equilibrium of a, a simultaneous game is to put yourself in the shoes of player one first and say, okay, well, what's the, my best response if player two does each of player two strategies? So if player two chooses L, then I'm choosing between one and zero, and one is better than zero, so what I would do is underline one. And then if player two chooses R, then I'm choosing between zero and one, and one is better than zero, so I underline the one over here. Then I have to do the same thing for player two, right? If I'm player two, and player one chooses L, then I'm choosing between this one, right, and this zero, one is better than zero, so I have an underline there. And if player one chooses R, then I'm choosing between zero and one. One is better than zero, so I underline there. And then what we end up with in this coordination game is two Nash equilibria, right? We have a Nash equilibria here where one and one are both underlined. So any box where both payoffs are underlined is a Nash equilibria, meaning it's a mutual best response. And then we have another Nash equilibria here. So we have two Nash equilibria, LL and RR right? There's a tendency for students to say that the Nash equilibria is one and one and one and one. Those are the payoffs within the Nash equilibria rather than the Nash equilibria themselves. So that doesn't really help us knowing which one they're going to do. And we'll talk about mixed strategy equilibria a little bit later. Um, but we have two Nash equilibria with the same payoffs. Now let's look at figure 3.3. Now here we have a difference, right? So here now our strategies are A and B. And we can see that 
we're going to get two Nash equilibria still, right? If player one does A, player two should do A. But if player one does B, player two should do B, right? And vice versa. And so we still get two Nash equilibria of A, A, and B, B. But clearly one is better than the other, right? And so we say that, you know, outcome, you know, AA, the Nash equilibria there is our Pareto optimal choice because it's making both of the players better off in this case, right? Remember Pareto efficiency really means we can make somebody, uh, if a Pareto improvement means we can make somebody better off without making somebody else worse off. And in this case, they are both made better off. And so it doesn't change the fact that BB is a Nash equilibrium, right? B is a best response um, for player one when player two chooses B and B is the best response for player two when player one chooses B. But they can both see that AA is better and so we would expect them both to choose the Pareto optimal choice in this case. Now here's uh, another type of coordination game where now our, uh, our payoffs are not the same, right? And so now here we have Chris who is player one and Pat who is player two. Um, and they are choosing, Chris is choosing between meat and fish uh, and Pat is choosing between red wine and white wine. And we have this sort of, this pattern of payoffs we often call the dating game, which I don't know is a little weird, but the idea behind the dating game is that they would both rather do something together than something apart, um, but they have different preferences, right? And so in this case, we would of course have red wine with meat and white wine with fish. I mean, how could you even imagine having something else? Um, but Chris prefers meat with red wine and Pat prefers fish with white wine. And so our two Nash equilibria uh, are meat red and fish white, but there's really no way to know where we're going to end up, right? We could end up in either one and in fact, if it's truly a simultaneous game and there's a mixed strategy Nash equilibria, we could end up uh, with some positive probability in a non-Nash -equil equilibrium outcome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the dating game is really about trying to figure out coordination and where it's going to be important in industrial organization is when we think about whether there's like a first uh, mover advantage in some games, right? So imagine that, um, Pat says, I'm coming with white wine, right? Then Chris is choosing between meat and fish and Chris says, oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna uh, choose fish even though that's not my favorite because I don't wanna have meat with white wine. On the other hand, if Chris can move first and say, I'm having meat, then Pat will say, okay, well, I'm bringing, I'll bring a red wine, right? Even though it's not Pat's favorite. Now, one of the most famous games is The Prisoner's Dilemma and you know, the story behind The Prisoner's Dilemma is is just illustrative, right? It's not necessarily where we're going to focus as economists. Um, but the idea is that the Nash equilibrium is not the social optimum. And by social optimum, we don't mean, you know, the best for the world. All we mean is the best for the two players. And so here we have player one and player two, and they've both been arrested. They've been separated and they can either not confess or they can confess. And the idea is if they both don't confess, then they only get a year in jail each. But if one of them confesses and the other one doesn't, then the, the person who confesses gets zero and the person who doesn't gets 20 years in jail. And then if they both confess, then they each get 10 years in jail. So, you know, this isn't too important from an economic point of view, but there are a lot of games that we can imagine that have this payoff structure and where we end up in the confess, confess Nash equilibrium, uh, even though the social optimum in this case is to not confess, right? And we can see the social optimum is uh, not confess, not confess, because the total payout there is negative two, and that's the best possible payout for these two players, right? In total, uh, the confess not confess is minus 20, as is the confess confess, right? Minus 10 plus minus 10 is minus 20. But let's just walk through this for a second and see why the confess confess is the Nash equilibrium. And so in this case, if player, if I'm player one and player two does not confess, then I'm choosing between minus one and zero, and zero is better than minus one, so I confess. 
if player two does confess, then I'm choosing between minus 20 and minus 10. Minus 10 is better than minus 20. And so again, I confess. In this case, confess is the dominant strategy. It's always better for player one to confess. The same is true for player two, right? This is a symmetrical game. And so player two in this case is going to uh, have the same thing. If player one doesn't confess, they're choosing between minus one and zero. Zero is better. If player one does confess, they're choosing between minus 20 and minus 10. And so our only Nash equilibrium in the prisoner's dilemma is confess, confess. Um, and that's not the best outcome, right? And so, you know, in terms of, you know, whether we can get to the social optimum in a prisoner's dilemma type situation really depends on whether or not we can change the rules, right? And if we can change the rules, either through regulation or something else, then we can get to the social optimum, um, but we'll have to, you know, that's going to depend on the situation. All right, so in, so we'll continue uh, this discussion in our next uh, video for, for chapter three, and um, we have you know, two or three more videos there.